Good evening, guys. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I have a couple of announcements uh, before we get started. We're going to have this event recorded. So if anyone in the room uh, minds being on the camera, uh, please let us know right now so that we don't record it. Oh, that would be me. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, seeing none, I uh, just have one, uh, quick, one more quick announcement. Uh, we have our sign-ups there. Uh, it just yeah, there. Uh, it, it just helps us to be uh, in touch with you uh, throughout the term. So if you guys uh, please sign up when you leave, uh, that'll be great. Um, and we also have a T-shirt cont uh, contest going on there, I believe. technical problems in blockchain um, and strategic problems. Um, typically that, that involves, we want to tokenize some asset and we want to sell that asset, how should we go about that? Um, or it involves, we want to do an ICO and we say no, you shouldn't do that. And then we, we help them kind of like go back and analyze whether or not that makes sense, whether or not blockchain makes sense to them and then kind of analyze it from a realistic perspective. Um, and we've been doing that for, for about a year and also a couple of, I, run a blog as well where we analyze different consensus protocols, different um, blockchain systems, and then we, we post that online on HackerDoom called Test of ICOs. Yeah, awesome. So Rob is actually a um, University of Waterloo alumni. Uh, yes, I feel like I'm coming. <laughs> See, I was really looking forward to this night, not just to you know, opine about FinTech and all that, but quite sincerely, it's really nice to come. Before we go into uh, everyone's uh, Asian experience here on the panel, I just wanted uh, if, if we could go over what your what your company does, and then it'll be I'd say easy for the audience to understand uh, what Asia would would mean for your company in the future. So if you guys could quickly explain to the audience how okay. how plans will work. Do you want to just kind of go in this order? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Okay, so as I mentioned, the company is called Plans Well, and I guess the best place to start to describe it for you is to give you a little bit of the story, the background story of the company. I suspect that uh, you guys have changed too much from my time, and there are a lot of uh, entrepreneurial types in this room, so it might, uh, might be intriguing to some of you. So um, in, in early 2012, 
I used to be an investment advisor at um, a company called CIBC Wood Dundee, which is a full service investment dealer, um, obviously a subsidiary of CIBC Wood Bank Banking Group. And um, a fellow, just to back up a little bit, so you know, after I left Waterloo, I'd start, I'd started out my career in finance, and then I'd had sort of wanderlust. I've had a, a love affair of sorts with the Orient, in particular, since I was a little boy. And so um, I'd worked for um, an insurance company. I worked for the stock exchange for a while, and I thought, you know, this is not doing it for me. I want to kind of go off and fill those experiential buckets most importantly for me, of doing the international thing. So I went off to Tokyo. I lived in Tokyo for five years. I lived in Seoul. Um, I got into uh, conventional media, which, of course, in the 90s became digital uh, media. So there was a big kind of continuing strand for me in digital media and marketing. And then um, I came back into the financial world. And there I found myself, like I said, at CIBC Wood Gundy. I'd you know, done all my qualifying courses and whatnot to do that. It's something I'd always aspired to do. It's just, you know, you may find that life takes you one way. And so um, in early 2012, um, I met a friend and colleague of mine who, um, you know, we, we were kind of over tea just talking about the, the fact that um, in the financial services industry, the investment industry in particular, um, there's a huge gap in the market. That is to say that something like at either between 50% and maybe two-thirds, depending on the stats you read and believe, of Canadians have never had a financial plan done. I, I would be surprised if the majority of this room has ever had one or even thought about one, um, but you probably should have one. And so this was a big opportunity for us, frankly, in the self-interest of fashion as advisors, to make financial plans and to get uh, clients to build our practice. And the more we looked into this, we realized well, this is a massive opportunity, but it's a problem because typically to get a financial plan, as I alluded to earlier, it takes about 40 plus hours of an expert financial planner's time. And I'm not just talking about investment planning, I'm talking holistically across the three main pillars of one's financial life. So investments, uh, risk management, insurance, and oil. And so, you know, you've got a couple of discovery meetings with a human financial planner, and then you've got 40 hours or so of that expert time. They use software typically that's really not good. Um, and so then there's a presentation meeting, and then there's the implementation. And because it's such a long rigmarole to go through this process, more than half the time, the implement implementation of those recommendations. <coughs> so it's fraught with difficulty. And so, basically, through these conversations, we kind of got the idea that, okay, well, is there a way to use, and, and, and Eric, who's my friend that I'm talking about, who's the CEO of the company, um, and who really ran with it, of course, um, we kind of thought, well, he had a background in digital media marketing, too. Is there a way that we can speed this process up? The big issue being that you can imagine if it takes multiple meetings and 40 plus hours of someone's time to do it, it's not a scalable endeavor, right? So you couldn't use it as like a business development kind of thing for any kind of a, you know, financial advisor. Um, and so basically what happened was we went out and we raised our initial tranche of money, I think it was 750K, and then we um, kind of have been working in earnest the last couple of years to develop it to the point where you can go on to our website, planswell.com.ca, whatever, um, go on your phone and answer a series of questions. We've optimized, minimized the number of questions it, it requires. It takes you literally maybe three to five minutes. And then using that user input of data, like top of mind questions like, when do you want to retire? Are you married? Do you have kids? Probably not many people here. Um, and lots of things, you know, what are your debts? What are your, what are your, um, what's your income, etc. Like, get those approximations. And then it takes all that information and then we do a bunch of calculations on the back end and boom, in next to real time, we have a financial plan, namely recommendations across those three main areas of one's financial life. And then this is all free. So, um, you know, um, the question in some of your minds might be, well, okay, you're not a charity, how do you make money? Well, we make money because um, after people get their financial plan, if there's a recommendation, like we're trying to optimize across those three areas, right? So we're not necessarily saying always you should invest or you should get insurance 
and, and you should get uh, a mortgage, you should refinance your mortgage or something. We're, we're saying, okay, what's the best use of your loaded resources? So if, for example, there's a, um, a recommendation for insurance, uh, like especially for young people, it might be a, there might be a recommendation in there for uh, liability insurance, and then we talk to you about it, you may have questions, uh, either live or we can chat with you, and then um, if you want to go ahead, then we just go out and we shop the market for you and get, get you the best deal. Of course, we think we think a piece of that. That's pretty much it. I've been growing like Matt, so. That's, <laughs> I've used it. It's a good, it's a product. Plansville well is actually very hot in the market right now. They just completed a $7 million funding round uh, in Toronto. So they've been doing very well. Um, Nelson, um, so pin trucks. It's a, it's a secure way of um, lending un unsecured loans. Um, and we, we can see the flyers uh, here. The audience has a good idea of uh, say how, how Pintrix is working. Why Singapore, though? Why, why base your company out of Singapore and uh, Vancouver? Uh, there's really there's no choice. Uh, as far as uh, Singapore is concerned, uh, they're very open to uh, blockchain technology. Uh, and they uh, have very clear guidelines of what is uh, crypto, uh, what is uh, token. Uh, and basically, they say uh, not all tokens are securities. However, in Canada, the United States, uh, we, uh, we look at it differently. Uh, so uh, as far as we're concerned, we have a decision to make. Uh, we either don't touch the blockchain, uh, don't touch the token, or uh, we should uh, uh, find out if there's any other people who accept us, uh, work with us, partner with us, and be able to uh, make it happen, uh, believing that this is a better way to facilitate Unsecure loan uh, for the F and uh, How it all got started was uh, I used to work in the bank too, uh, and in the bank uh, we lend money to people when we need it. Uh, we lend money to you when you don't need it, and we are very good at lending you cash on cash. So if you have a saving deposit of a million dollars sitting in our bank, uh, we will lend you one million dollars, no more than what you have in, in saving accounts. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, if I have one million dollars sitting in my bank, why would I want to borrow money from you? However, uh, there are other reasons, uh, taxation, credit building, and what have you. So that's the market they're looking after. So there's a very big gap there for small businesses uh, like us. Uh, I have a hard time getting loan, getting support from banks. Uh, so I told myself, someday we're going to change that. Uh, and now we have the opportunities. Because the bank today, they don't want to lend anything less than a million dollars. Because they don't have the technology. Everything is mostly manual. Uh, and they just want to do it that way. Because the cost is high, they cannot afford to do it under that limit. However, most of the uh, SME out there, especially those in the uh, less developed countries, all they need is $10,000 to save a day. Uh, and when they have unexpected cash flow problem, who's going to dare to help them? Uh, we find accredited investors, financial institutions on the right hand side, and uh, we don't lend our own money. Uh, we facilitate them to lend their money, their business rules, their credit scoring engine to be able to lend to small businesses. Uh, so to answer your question, why Singapore? Mm -hmm. uh, Singapore has been rated the most business-friendly countries uh, a few years back. Uh, I don't know whether it still is, but the fact that Trump and uh, Kim Jong-un happens to have their meeting last week there tell us that they are probably quite friendly uh, to the rest of the world. Um, <laughs> yeah, and uh, uh, many people in Singapore, actually, I was there, I was actually staying at the same hotel uh, in Shangri-La, uh, where uh, they are having a meeting. Uh, and many people there say, uh, received messages uh, from North America, uh, 
anyway, I'll, I'll soon be back in the next job, soon I? <laughs> Let me get into politics. <laughs> Let's just say, uh, 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 there was a joke around there saying that, why don't you keep both of them there in Singapore? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, can I move my chair? Sure, I got it. I'm following. Sure. Okay. You Sorry. No, it's okay. I think I'm good. Yeah, yeah so this is Pablo, uh, but you didn't ask. Sure. Yeah, that's what I was going uh, So, Pablo worked with an um, Indian fintech company called Paytm. Uh, and Paytm has re revolutionized how Indians have been making their bill payments in a lot of ways. Uh, it's, a, it's a big bill payment consolidator. And uh, Pablo has some has done some consulting work for for, uh, for them. So Pablo, just want to pick your brain on uh, wh how how fast is Paytm growing in terms of transactions, and that's part of my question. I, I can definitely not talk about that. Okay. <laughs> so I I all of the consulting work with it is pretty confidential. Okay. Um, I I can mention some things about Paytm, but um, I can mention. In, in the public. Domain. I'll tell you what I can mention. So. In the in the public domain. But, that's, it's 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 a fast growing company. I mean, I mean, their office in Toronto is less than two years old, and they already have about a hundred employees. It's it's a large company, and and and, and they're fantastically large in India. Paytm stands for Pay Through Mobile, because they allow people to pay through SMS. I mean, way nicer than something like Interact transfers here. Um, so I, I think they're very revolutionary when it comes to um, transactions and sending money. And I think it's pretty important right now, as, as we mentioned, a lot of people need to have better systems for sending money around, and, and Paytm is, is, is very friendly doing that. Um, that said, Paytm was also invested by Alibaba for $600 million, so there, there's a lot of different interests in the, the, the Asian continent between both companies. And I don't know, that was not your question, but that was no, that, <laughs> some answer of some sort. That's just some valuable information. And when, when Paytm was entering Canada, like a, a foreign company, Entering a Western market, obviously there are going to be some challenges. It's a, it's a different market. It's a, consumers with different tastes and preferences, yeah. different challenges. Um, and again, a lot of the work you did confidential. Yes, so. I, I, a lot of, also, and I'll, okay, what I can say is that a lot of what we did was related to that problem, related to the problem of like how do you how do you bring that to Canada. Um, I think the best answer I could give that's still pretty confidential is download the Paytm app and, and see what they're doing, and, and you would recognize the kind of things that they're doing really to to you. How you spell that? Um, pay, uh, like P A Y, and then T M, like the letter T and the letter M. One word? Um, yeah, yeah, one word. And do you want to delve into some of I, I, I can talk about uh, of the continental things, and I can talk about them in a general way, but I prefer to do that than talking about uh, specifically for that company. Um, a, lot, a lot of this stuff is pretty confidential. Like the amount of transactions they're doing is pretty confidential because um, obviously the investors want to know that too. And, um, <laughs> they want, they, People need to change things and modify things in order to get those answers. So, so yeah, I can't talk about that. I can talk about behaviors and general things, but I'd rather not talk about super private stuff. Sure, I think the audience will value that as well. Yeah, and, and also I, I was a waterless student like two years ago, so I can also give the ex like like how how do you jump that path, right? So I started a consulting business because we didn't have any money and we're trying to like build a different company. So I I can talk about things that are related to Asia, related to that, um, but no details on the companies we've worked sure. with. I prefer. And I believe you also did some blockchain consulting work for companies in India. Um, Paytm was the, the only India company. I mean, we've done Singapore. Mm -hmm. um, we've done some Asian companies. So we've we've done uh, like right now we're we're working with a Chinese company that has also offices in Toronto uh, called Huairu, Y R O O. Um, we've, we've, they're doing a, an artificial intelligence system for for um, finding products. So if you want to say, find the best price for X product, you would find it across different web pages and websites and historically. And they said, well, let's use blockchain as a time machine and historically lock down the price of something and then use that in order to, to warranty the best price ever because we historically cannot modify the prices. So they're doing some very interesting stuff in a project called Tethys that we're, we're very seriously part of. So so I, I've done stuff with companies there too. Well, I guess it depends on the, what's the question. I'd say, where do you? I'm I'm moving on to more uh, gender trends. Yeah, here. sorry about that. Yeah, um, we see uh, companies like uh, Alibaba, uh, yeah. Tencent um, in Asia, but we we see WeChat, where a Chinese consumer today can do a hundred different things through through just one app application. How come we 
haven't gone through that innovation phase here and I think that's a great question. I mean, the, the, the question here is in regulation and, and the whole concept of red tape. The whole concept that, that we should overprotect the citizens so the citizens don't make a decision that is going to hurt them. Um, but at some point, when I'm just trying to send someone 100 bucks or 20 bucks, I, I mean, that, that's the decision I should be responsible for. Um, I, I, I think the problem in the, the current Canadian government um, r related to fintech is the overprotection of citizens for the wrong reasons that ends up not only not overprotecting you, but affecting your company, affecting the ability that a lot of people end up going to other countries. A lot of companies end up incorporating in different continents. A lot of my friends in Canada ended up in Singapore as well, or, or in Switzerland, two nation states that are super tiny, but that because they're friendly, because they didn't take that path, now they're very wealthy, very safe, very nice places to be in. So, so I'll invite the argument that by having um, friendly businesses, uh, you kill consumer protectionism. I, I think you can have both and still give freedom to people. I, I'm, I'm sure the other two speakers can definitely talk a lot about that stuff. I have a question. Yeah. So this <coughs> overprotection uh, is not founded in your opinion. I mean, those countries, maybe because they are small, you know, you, you cannot have, uh, maybe I should put the question another way. Did, didn't we have situation in those countries that are more open where the citizens are not protected, that, that, you know, maybe they should be protected. You know what I mean? Do, 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 do we have situation where the citizens were hurt by this openness, you know? Yeah, I mean, I mean, we, we have those consumer protection things because the law is based on history, on how, how previous things that have gone wrong, so then we create laws on top of that. Um, I, I, think, I think society has changed in many ways that we should be looking at it differently. I mean, what Switzerland did is they just created a bunker country. Like, the country is super neutral. Um, they have the most weapons out of any other country because they, they, they keep themselves super protected. And then they said, we'll, we'll do business with everyone, but we'll, we're not going to take part of the political process so that we don't piss anyone off. So I think, yeah, there's, there's, there's countermeasurement when it comes to military and country protection when you open borders to, to business as well. I think there's a connection to that. I think that's not a question. So yeah, I think if it's working, it's fine. I would just add to that um, and tie it back to Waterloo. So I studied economics at Waterloo. Started up physics and realized that's not my thing. Um, that's one fun, fun, fun fact before Rob, you continue. So Rob yeah. is a Harvard uh, PhD dropout in yeah. East Asian and Business Studies. Yeah, those are my words exactly as copy. <laughs> um, but from the economic standpoint and, and how it leads to a sort of more protected, slower environment. We're talking about regulation here. Talking, both of you gentlemen were talking about Singapore being more advanced in that way. I would suggest that both of those countries have to be. They're tiny. Um, but we have a very oligopolistic um, corporate structure in Canada. You know, we have a small cadre of entrenched uh, companies, um, probably most importantly in the financial sector, right? You've got uh, the five, sometimes called the six big banks. And um, this is really problematic. So I'll just give you a little factoid that can key into that. So you're probably not aware at all that, um, sadly, Canada has the world's highest mutual fund fees. So the last I checked, which was some months ago, I'm sure it hasn't come down that much, the average mutual fund fee every year is 2.42%, right? So whoever the portfolio manager of those funds are, um, it's a little different if you're index funds, but this is exorbitant. And clearly this is, to a great degree, the result of this kind of concentrated, some would even say collusive um, sort of environment certainly leads itself to that. And, you know, having been a, 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 an employee on Bay Street, I can tell you that pretty much everybody knows what everybody's doing. So it's kind of a collusive, interbred sort of situation. And they are out to protect their interests. They don't give a damn about us. And that's what I can tell you absolutely is a business person. And that's the philosophy that um, sort of leads us to what we're doing at Planswell. I'm not here just to doubt plans, shout plans well, but obviously it's what I know most about. And our primary mission, really, um, is to be a fiduciary. Does everybody know what? A, does anybody, everybody know what a fiduciary is? I'm going to pick someone who looks really serious and really. Smart. <laughs> I bet you, you know. Yeah, you. <laughs> you know what a fiduciary is? No, I have no idea. Does anybody know? You know? It's someone who has some investment for something. Yes.
So um, this is not the agenda of the big banking groups to act in the best interest of their client from a financial standpoint, right? Can anybody imagine what the, what the agenda of the big banks is? Uh, that is that is one yeah ultimately, um, but in terms of you know their relationship to and the transactions that they do with, with customers and clients, what would that be? Can anybody posit the reason for that? To make money. To make money, yes. Can control. You, sorry. Control like the, have as much control as possible. Kinda. So um, their agenda really is to get you in ultimately every single one of their financial products, right? So you've got a CIBC is one example, it's CIBC financial group. So I had mentioned to you before, I work for Rick Gundy, which is the quote unquote full service investment deal, where they also have uh, people in the banks that we'll talk to you about credit, and you can get insurance there, and you can get um, all manner of financial products. So ideally, they would love to have you in every single one of those, regardless of whether that makes sense for you. In fact, in many cases, there's a conflict and it doesn't make sense for you. So, unfortunately, a lot of students graduate and they have significant high interest debt, credit card debt, maybe two, right? Not just your student loans. And so, what happens is you come out and you might just think automatically, because in Canada, it's again, it's a small number of financial institutions. It's not like south of the border where they have hundreds, thousands of banks, There's more competition. So you come out and you think, oh, I get a job, and you start saving a, a few hundred dollars a month, and then you think, well, I gotta do something with this. And, hey, my friend said this, or I always see the, the banks on the corner of wherever land you live. And you, you automatically kind of think, I'm gonna go there. And you go in, you'll talk to the financial advisor, um, Pretty cynical about this. Is part of my swahili. And you you will go there, and then you will say, "Oh, I saw a commercial, or my friend told me, or my parents told me, I should start investing this little bit of money that I have." And what's going to happen? What what are they going to tell you? Like you you've probably been banking with them, probably at school for years already, and you're going to. What do you think that financial advisor is going to say to you? Yeah, but but what what did I mention before that there's a high pro probability that you have when you just graduate? Because what what else do you have? Student debt. You have debt. So what's in your best interest? What would a fiduciary advocate on your behalf say to you? Pay off your debt. Pay off the debt. Maybe maybe that's the right decision. And or you know pay off some of your debt, whatever the, whatever that optimized solution is, or, or maybe you're a young person and you've got a, you've got long running room over which to to um, run your career. It could be 40, it could be 50. God knows the retirement age keeps going further and further afield. Right? It could be 50 years that you've got. What happens if you're five years into your career and you fall off a motorcycle? What happens? Seriously, other than other than that, the immediate effect. <laughs> what happens in your life? You're not earning. You can't. You can't earn. So, so what? No insurance. You're done. Okay. So that going back to that conversation that you just had automatically because you're Canadian, you know, and you're richer than you think, and all this crap. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you want to turn that around. It's actually they're richer than you. So anyway, I, I'm going on. <laughs> I'm not the only person in the room, and I'm nervous, so I'll throw it over to you, Danielson. Danielson. Yeah. Well, I'd like to get back to uh, your question. Uh, what is right or wrong to be overprotected? Uh, I kind of see there's three kinds of countries in this world. Uh, there's the very, very small countries, uh, like Gibraltar, like, uh, like uh, there was a few of them that uh, came in the mind. Andorra, the smallest country in the world. Uh, it's a little tiny country that they actually have people, even people before. Uh, near the Fiji, uh, and something started with B. Uh, anyone can help me out? Vanuatu? Vanuatu. 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 Okay. Uh, it's like those are one type. Uh, 
like you can do whatever you want and there's no regulation. And then you have uh, the North America, uh, the America, the uh, Canada, uh, the uh, protecting for the consumers. They don't care how much you invest in. If you invest $25 into a loan, they, they say this is security. If you invest 25 cents in a loan, that is also security. I mean, uh, really? Uh, there, there has to be a certain amount that tells you what to protect. I mean, I won't protect 25 cents, would you? You're not even protecting $2. So what is the amount that you need to be protected? Is it 1000 Is it $250? Nobody knows. In a corporation, there's usually some guideline. Like in my company, uh, if you are uh, spending like $250, uh, and recently you were raising for $500 because of the uh, inflation, you don't have to get approval. Go and spend it. Do whatever it takes to get the business running. Don't come and bother me for $10, this, $25, that, that you have to get approval on. But if it's over $500, that's worth protecting. So these two are the extremes. One is no protection, and the other one is, uh, in your opinion, overprotecting. There's something in the middle called Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> and they happen to say, look, you know, under this condition, you don't need protection. Under that condition, yes, you need to protect you. And to me, that is running a balanced budget, running a balanced uh, style, a scheme like that. Uh, you're not overprotecting, but you're not underprotecting either. So uh, it's entirely up to you or you know how to interpret this. Uh, this is how I see. Uh, it's really three three kinds of countries in this world. Can I, can I uh, comment? Because I, I wasn't sure that everybody knew what you were talking about and how uh, tremendous an accomplishment that is that you said that last November you did an ICO and you raised 25 million bucks. Does everybody know what an ICO is? Yeah? You want to explain it? Uh, it's like an initial coin offering. So you're basically like selling off your uh, digital currency and to raise money as an initial <laughs> offering, right? <laughs> that's, that's my mass and understanding. Yeah. <laughs> that's basically it. Uh, you did there's it. many ways to uh, describe that. Uh, basically, uh, the simplest way to look at uh, a token is just a digital representation of something. And uh, depending on how you use that token, it can be illegal, it can be legal. So if you go to, say, a casino, uh, or even on a cake to play uh, machines. It used to be many years ago, you have to put in Canadian loony, Canadian toony, uh, and, or quarters, uh, let's say, in order to play those machines. And it's very hard to make those machines to be customized to each country. So they came up with something called token. All you have to do is to exchange your money into the token, then you can play the machine. Simple as that. Gambling, uh, uh, the casino is the same thing. You go in there, uh, you can give them whatever currency you want. They give you one thing called token, and then you play with it. So it's a utility. As long as you don't uh, sell that as a security, then that's fine. Uh, that is the view of uh, some of the countries out there, like Singapore. Now, if you take you to the extreme of Gibraltar, or then to that kind of country. Uh, they say it doesn't matter. Everything is not security. But in Canada, the United States, everything is security, regardless of what they are. I mean, to give you an idea, if you if you purchase something and it increases in price, it could, it could be considered a security no matter what it is. It could be food. It could be it could be a can of Coke. It could be a water bottle. Anything that increases in price for some reason, it's, it could be considered a security. So I, I think the regulation doesn't do what, it, what it's supposed to do, and I think that's an issue with it. Uh, <clears throat> coming back with the overprotection, um, do you think that's fair to say that uh, the high volatility in the prices of cryptocurrency makes sense to, 
to have some kind of consumer protection. Let's assume that uh, a lot of people get enthusiastic at Bitcoin going from 2,000 to 20,000 and people invest at the highest level of 20,000 and now they are lost 70% uh, of their investment because Bitcoin is like $6,000 right now, yeah? So, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, the, the way I see the protection is in this way, yeah? If you have a big swings, you cannot leave uh, ordinary citizens to like play casino with their savings, you know what I mean? We allow that for lottery though. You can buy one in a million lottery and wait, that's legal. I could right now buy $10,000 on lottery tickets. Why is that legal? Why, why, because why people real million and that's okay. People realize, uh, people understand lottery and they realize what their odds of winning. But if, if they don't understand cryptocurrency and you facilitate for them to play, you know, you could screw up the whole economy. You then know what I mean? probably have, say, this is the classification, this is how much this cryptocurrency can fail, this variation that it's, it's like the, there should be a classification process probably that says this is how stable it is. I think your concern is about the, uh, the big swing. Yeah, and the, 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 like the, to, uh, the fact that each citizen, uh, if it's, uh, it has the opportunity to play, yeah, without any protection, yeah, just uh, for I the, the feeling of the market. Q and A do later, um, but I just since the the agenda for the panel is um, is is the best closing our weeks. Let's keep our questions focused on that. Uh, but please feel free to ask your question in the Q and A. Yes. Just have a burning question uh, for Rob right now. Um, so Rob, you're you worked in Asian markets before, and. You said you were mentioning to me that you wanted plans to expand to Korean Japanese markets as well. Uh, is there like a real opportunity for plans well there? Do you see the Asian consumer being served well in terms of financial planning needs? No. You don't? Okay. And no, why is that? No, no to your second part of the question, which is, is the Asian consumer typically being served well in terms of financial planning and, and good advice? No. Um, is there an opportunity for a company like Planswell there that's offering um, what we feel is agnostic, fiduciary kind of um, uh, technology that makes it much simpler to get a financial plan? Everybody in this room should have a financial plan. Like, whether you get it from me uh, through Planswell or you go and you find your investment advisor and they actually give you a holistic financial plan, I don't mean what most advisors term is a investment is a financial plan by the way. Because usually they say it's a financial plan, but it's nonsense, it's an investment plan. Right? We are not interested, for example, in recreating the problems in the real world financial system that exists uh, that exists in that and then doing it digitally. Um, so there is an opportunity. Um, you know, whether it be in Japan, you mentioned in Korea, um, I've been an advocate in our in our company for going particularly to Japan and Korea first rather than China. Everyone talks about China and India because it's, you know, the big, the, the, the grand fromage, right? Particularly China. Um, but it's fraught with other sorts of difficulties in terms of wanting to expand your business, right? Um, Japan, which I'm very familiar with, having lived there for five years, and done a lot of business there. It, you know, it's a stable, uh, well-regulated company. They're behind the curve in terms of fintech, even compared to Canada. Um, that won't take long to change, though, if I understand Japanese properly. Um, and so our strategy, broadly, is to, um, yes, we want to go into Asia. Um, yes, it's a big market. We want to get into Europe, too. But our strategy, in particular, for Asia is not go to China first, because people have a tendency um, in um, China to kind of look at things that are in Japan and increasingly in Korea, uh, which in my view is kind of Seoul is becoming the Paris of the East. Um, uh, full disclosure, my wife's Korean. So. <laughs> <laughs> this is a recording, I love you, honey. Um, you know, um, people in China and maybe other parts of Asia tend to look upon things that are offered in or made in Japan as being of a higher standard. Um, and that's been the case for a long time. So our, our thought is if we can go to those, those two countries and break in there, that would be a fantastic way to later go into China. So for example, today and yesterday I've been having conversations with a fellow who, um, has, uh, who is the founder and CEO of the 
if not the most successful, the second most successful fintech in Korea is a, is a company called, um, I'm going to get this wrong, Viva Republica, I think it is, which is an interesting name, Latin for a, a Korean company, and they have a platform uh, called Toss. And, um, you know, there, there's kind of a theme here. So they started with, um, you, you probably know about them, right? You heard of them before? So they have, uh, they have, they started with a peer-to-peer uh, payments uh, technology because the, the payment system in Korea was archaic. And so within a very short period of time, they have, um, they have managed to acquire, um, it's either six or seven million, I think it's seven million customers in less than two years. An even more dramatic example was a company called, um, um, well, before I say that, I would say like in, 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 in countries like Korea and maybe in Asia in general, uh, or like China, um, you don't really have FinTech, I'd say it's more tech thin. You know, it's the tech comes first and the strategy is and then they're able to build a community around this technology and then you can go more fin. So a perfect example is the most successful FinTech in South Korea, of course. Um, is um, a company uh, that started out as a messaging app called uh, um, Kakao Talk. Um, are there any Koreans in the audience? No. It's weird, when I was coming around Ring Road here, I asked this lady, where's this where's the science teaching building? And she was Korean, though. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, um, the stat I was gonna give you was um, last August when they launched. So they had this big platform, super successful. I know my wife's always on there, like messaging Kakao Talk. And um, they have a penetration of, there are 50 million devices in Korea that 49 point something um, who are on, that are connected to this thing. There are only 50 million people in Korea. So this is astonishing in my view. Compare that to Canada. And so they use that as a platform. And then last August, they started a bank, Kakao Bank. And their user acquisition in the first month um, they got three million customers. By the second month, they had five million customers. It's amazing. So, are we behind? Yeah, big time. Um, so, Nelson, in, in terms of your expansion strategy in uh, Singapore, how how well is the ICO being received there? I know you raised a lot of money. What would you say are your next steps in terms of expanding in Asia? We just are an internal uh, council to help us uh, get licensing uh, around the world. Uh, it turns out that uh, in Indonesia, you don't need a license to do P2 lending. Uh, Indonesia is a pretty big country. It's rated, I think, number two. In population? In population. Is it? I don't know, it's big. Uh, so China, uh, Second one is yeah. Indonesia. It's, it's the, the most populous one. Muslim nation, uh, for sure. But I don't know in terms of absolute. I would guess number four. It's on Google. Yeah. It's 210 million now. Yeah, yeah. Sure. It's, it's pretty huge. And the top four are China, Indonesia, India, and uh, the US. USA. Uh, so anyway, it's one of the top four. Uh, so they don't need regulation. Uh, we're running into a problem in uh, Canada. In order to get a license to do what we do, needs uh, to go through a process that can take anywhere between uh, six months to 18 months according to the uh, So if you put the two together, uh, no wonder uh, we are actually having people in uh, Vietnam next week uh, and in Indonesia, which we already have uh, partners talking to us about uh, starting up over there. Uh, and Canada uh, is a little long. And in order to borrow a license from someone who has already established in here, uh, the latest uh, discussion that we had was they need somewhere between 10 to 15 percent of return just to use their license. How much can the lender lend their unsecured loan in order to get over? 10, 15 percent to pay for the license in order to be operating in Canada. This is suffocating. <coughs> we may not 
be able to start Canada fast enough. But definitely, uh, we will be in Singapore, in Indonesia, Vietnam, Myanmar, all those countries that are in need of our service, but they allowing us to lend the money that they're most needed in the small business so they can flow. Uh, you got a question? Uh, yeah. Are we entertaining the Q&A? Uh, uh, just a quick question for Pablo, and then we'll open it for q &A. Okay. So Pablo, any expansion strategies you have for uh, Asia or for Girardo? Do you see uh, some countries being more uh, friendly <coughs> in the it's, uh, ICO blockchain consulting? Well, I think it's super sad because we have some clients that end up moving there. And I think it's sad because I, I feel like Canada is losing really good people. And what scares me is what happened to Europe. You know, like Europe used to have good tech companies like Skype and Nokia. And, uh, with Sony Ericsson, and there were a bunch of phone companies in Europe 10 years ago. Right now, there's there's no big tech companies in Europe because of consumer protectionism. Um, and it's not like I want some anarchy government where there's no ruling. But I, I think that's, I mean, there, there's a huge gray area between those two points. And I think what scares me is the same reason that most software developers here at Waterloo end up going to San Francisco, which is I want to go to a place that where I'm more free to do what I want to do. And I feel like we're losing that in Canada. So do I have plans to expand to, to, to Asia? No, probably not, because um, my first plan would be, I, I wanna, uh, probably California would be the next place, um, just because we're doing, we're focused more on the tech side, and we see a lot of investment still, Silicon Valley is pretty strong for investment. Um, in terms of Asia, we have our friends in Asia, we can send companies to Asia, we can help them out in Asia. Um, we have a lot of investors that we deal with in Asia, especially China and Singapore. So, so we can help with that. But I still, I still really like the way of living here in Canada. Um, I just, I just hope we, we slowly change with that. I think events like this are things where I want to, I want the next generation of Canadians, right, to, to think about consumer protectionism in a different way. So, so yeah, I prefer living here, um, and I, I, I like, I like the standards of life here way more than in Asia. But I also want, I also think that Canada can improve very dramatically. Um, with few changes in order to get more competitive, competitive with, with Asia and not become like what happened to Europe now. Are you optimistic? <laughs> yeah, honestly, yeah. I, I think, I, I, uh, look, 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 Ethereum happened in, 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 in Waterloo. Like, like, not very far from here, um, Vitalik went to one of these this classrooms, within 100 meters of where we are, and started Ethereum. So I, I think tech side works super fucking solid. Um, and, and I think the fact that, that we started the tech side and the tech side started a big part of the revolution, I, I think that, yeah, that makes me optimistic. I think the old people, the old Canadians, are one of the problems. I, th I think, that, well, it's the old I'm mentality. Only 19 for the record. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't I, I, that category. I, I, you know what I mean, right? Like, I think there's an old school mentality on that sector because for them, Canada became a prosperous nation based on different research than the current Canadians are looking for. I think current Canadians are looking to have prosperity through technology and advances instead of through natural resources. And I think that switch has been really strong. So I, I, I think that the current generation does want to move in that direction, I think. I, I, yeah, I would tend to disagree with that or maybe I, I would lessen the effect of that. I think it's got more to do with, like I said before, oh, we, we talked about regulations, right? Yeah. But I think some of those regulations are there um, at, at, at the request of and through the power of the banks, in particular the banks. Yeah. Like, and I'll give you an example in terms of you know how serpentine our regulatory process is. So, like, part of what we do in our company is, um, you know, we recommend, as I said, in investments, insurance, and and um, lending, borrowing, which for us thus far is limited to just mortgages. But on the investment side of things, we have our own robo advisor, right? It's an investment uh, platform in that regard. And so, to get the do not call robo um, approval took us almost a year of hard slogging with the Ontario Securities Commission, which is, you know, the biggest one of how many are there? There's one in every province and territory in Canada. Like, there's no overall securities administrator. This is a huge problem right there. But I think those kinds of things serve the interests of the incumbent banks, right? If we can get rid of that, we can simplify. This is part of the advantage, like, built in advantage of authoritarian. It, um, it, suffocates, it suffocates competition. 
if you had one unifying strategy across the country, then it's easier for startups to compete with yeah. the next. If you make it more complicated, it's, it's going to be harder for you to compete. Yeah, they're trying to frustrate companies like us. Absolutely, right? Like, think about what I said before. I think, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a profound example. It's the one I know best. But that's a really big deal, that there's this big need that banks should have been offering. Um, that you should get the best advice and you should look at your whole financial life in, in terms of what makes sense for you to do where and how to apportion your resources properly. And so therefore that requires that you should have some semblance of a financial plan, either a written one or a verbal one. But they're not doing it because again their agenda is to get you into every single one of the products. So they try and stymie you in every possible way. Don't you think that AI can change that? Like, if I create a really good financial projection AI using your data or whatever, um, can, can I just like destroy those biases and say, hey, this is a better planner that has nothing to do with the bank's interest? They still control a lot of the power, right? Like, yeah. They, like the assets behind that that we're recommending, like we're agnostic as far as the products are concerned, we're not the product right. uh, manufacturer, right? Which the banks are. It's, it's a problem. They're still going to hold it, but they're going to they're going to try and thwart the progress of fintech startups like us as much as they can. Yes, I, I, I do agree with that. Yeah. But. Essentially, what I found is that they control the field. Mm -hmm. So, for example, as an ICO, I wanted to invest in Kit, which is a local company, you know, Waterloo, and you go through the whole thing, and then a week later, you get a you know a, a uh, registration information back saying that the uh, SEC will not let you buy into uh, an ICO. The OSC, yeah. Yeah, even though it's, you know, you're supporting Canadian development. Yeah, that's you know, really we can't participate in our own development. We have to go until it's retail, lose all the advantages, and then we can invest. Well, what's the point of that? You, again, you know, you're basically being circumvented by the banks who are not letting you participate. They don't want to let you enter into the market. Some, and somebody, sorry, no, no, I was going to say quickly, somebody told me something that I, I thought was really interesting a couple months ago with regard to banks and their innovation. So they had these digital factories, innovation factories, accelerators, I don't know what that is. In terms of some change. Scotia Bank has a digital factory which is around the corner from where we are. Like they employ tons of people and tons of capital. And you know, ostensibly they're trying to do some kind of uh, FinTech innovation. But somebody had said that, well you know what they're really doing? It's just a freaking patent mill, right? So they're just trying to um, get all these little things so that they can, um, when, when a smaller startup, there's some, do I have like something on my head or what? No. I, I worked in the innovation fintech team in Scotia Bank. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's good. I'm just still going to make my point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so somebody said something, and I, you know, maybe you can verify whether you think this is the case, but you know, they're just patent mills for ultimately they're going to troll and they're going to, you know, it's another tool with which they're going to be able to control startups, which is problematic. I just want to open it uh, for q and We'll just take one more question because we're already running over time, and then we'll open the house to network. Yes, sir. a company like Binance or Malta uh, already having like, a great relationship with the government, Binance is probably a consumer of the percentage of the GDP, uh, and they're trying to get the government to buy into their product. Do you think that that's a centralized blockchain companies and governments and smaller countries. What do you think of that relationship? Well, finance uh, started in China. Uh, yeah. China is basically uh, it's even more uh, restrictive yeah. than uh, North America. They say, I don't care what you run as long as it's ICO, we cannot do it. Uh, they don't even declare that a security. Uh, there's no license. They just don't want ICO. Uh, so they're chasing all the exchanges away. And that's the result of Malta um, taking over um, the, uh, the good things that uh, Binance is uh, giving them. Um, yeah, I, I think my question was more around like, what do you think of moving to such a small country and the impact that could have of the how the government's going to work with a centralized company there? That's a considerable portion of the GDP. Well, uh, in terms of the, uh, if I answer your question this way. Uh, the money that we have raised in the ICO, uh, we're paying 70% tax to uh, Singapore. So uh, Binance moving over there, uh, definitely Malta is, is uh, increasing their GDP big time. 7%? 17%. 17%. Oh, they said 7%. <laughs> 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 you got me all excited about going to Singapore and doing an ICO, and then it was like, 
have gone. <laughs> 17 is, uh, is, is smaller than uh, the corporate tax here in Canada. Guys, we could please have a big round of applause for yeah. the panelists. Yeah. With that, the floor is open for networking. Thank you so much.